Spicoidate is parametric equations, graphs, and applications. A plane curve with a set of points x, y, such that x equals some function t and y equals some other function t. Both f and g are defined on an interval i. The equations x equals f of t and y equals g of t are called parametric equations. with parameter t. So let's see an example. Example 1, let x equal t squared and y equal 2t plus 3 for t in the interval from negative 3 to 3. Graph the set of ordered pairs x, y. Okay, so it's really important that you know that we're talking about a set of ordered pairs. Okay, so we've got a set of ordered pairs but we're going to let x be represented by that t squared from here. And the y coordinate, we're going to let that be 2t plus 3. And so really all we're going to do is we're going to start plugging in numbers from this interval. Okay? We're going to plug in numbers from this interval. Let's, let's hold off on that. Let's go to Desmos. And let's, let's just see what the graph looks like first before we confuse ourselves with the math. We've got a point, an xy point, where the x coordinate is t squared. And the y coordinate is 2t plus 3. Okay. Now, that's, that graph right there is not the whole story. We have to look at this interval. And we have to fix this interval to be from negative 3 to three like they want. So let's uh, let's look at this. Looks like we've got a, a parabola on its side. You can see the vertex over here. Looks like about uh, the point zero three. Yeah, the point zero three. And we can see it, it goes over here to about, I don't know, about nine or so. But that's what it's going to look like. So let's see what we would uh, have to do without the graphing software. Okay. Um, basically, what you have to do is take these numbers in the interval, these t values, and plug them in. Okay. So it's almost like we have a, a t table, and we're going to plug in negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, and three. We're going to plug in all these values. Okay. And make a new ordered pair. So imagine what your ordered pair would be if you plugged in each of those numbers negative 3. Well, if I take that and square it, I'm going to have negative 3 squared is positive 9. And then if I take that negative 3 times 2 is negative 6, plus 3 is negative 3. I've got a point, 9 comma negative 3. 9 comma negative 3. So I'm going to do that for each of those numbers. I'm going to plug in negative 2. Square it, I get 4. 2 times negative 2 plus 3 is negative 1. All I'm doing is plugging in negative 2. Now I'm going to plug in negative 1. Square it, you get 1. 2 times negative 1 plus 3 is 1. Plug in 0. 0 squared is 0. 2 times 0 plus 3 is 3. Plug in 1. Squared is 1. 2 times 1 plus 3 is 5. Plug in 2. Squared is 4. 2 times 2 plus 3 is 7. Plug in 3. Squared is 9. And 2 times 3 plus 3 is 9. So basically, I've got a whole bunch of ordered pairs. I've got a whole bunch of x, y points. And, uh, and that's what I would graph. And uh, keep in mind, this is what our picture looks like. It's a sideways parabola. And so that's what our picture should look like. I guess you want to pay attention to, pay attention to the x numbers. Notice that the smallest x number is 0 and the largest x number is 9. And then look at your smallest y number is negative 3, and your biggest y number is 9. You can use those numbers to figure out how big to make the graph, or how big to make your axes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 
And one, two, three. If you look at your points, you've got nine, negative three, four, negative one, 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 zero, three, one, five, four, seven, nine, nine. And what you have is a sideways parabola, just like, just like you thought, okay? Just like you thought. Now notice, notice that parabola doesn't go on and on forever. So, you know, you're not going to put, you're not going to extend this and say it goes on and on forever like you did in algebra class. It stops, okay? So do not put those arrows on there. It stops. Specifically, it's going to stop here at 9 and not go any farther than that. And so at some point, it's going to be kind of important that you pay attention to the fact that this graph is between zero and nine. But for right now, we want that graph, there it is. Either you do it by hand or you do it by uh, graphing calculator. Example two, find a rectangular equation for the plane curve that was given to us in example one. This is the same thing we just saw in example one. So when they say rectangular, what do they mean? And they want x and y, okay? They want an x-y equation. They don't want the parametric representation with t's in it. They want just x and y. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, pick one equation and solve for t or isolate. Okay. Pick one of the two equations, isolate T, and plug that in the other. Okay, the other equation. That's what we're going to do. So you would have your choice, I suppose, of whether you want to isolate T in this one or T in this one. And it doesn't totally matter. You're going to want to try to pick the one that you think is going to be easier. Okay. I think the one on the right is going to be easier. I think this one. So let's isolate t. I'm going to subtract that 3 over. 2t equals y minus 3. And divide by 2. t is going to equal y minus 3 over 2. We're going to take that and plug that into the other equation. So take this and put it in for t in that other equation. We would have x equals that stuff squared. y minus 3 over 2 squared. Okay? Now remember what the goal was. We want a rectangular equation, so we want x and y, and that's what we've got right there. We have a rectangular equation. Now, does anybody, anybody know what that looks like? Anybody know what shape that makes? We should, because we just drew it in example 1. Remember when we drew it in example 1, it was that sideways parabola. Okay? The parametric representation we plugged in, we got that sideways parabola. That's what this is in rectangular form, is a sideways parabola. Maybe you would remember. Remember back in algebra class when you had something that looked like y equals x squared? We knew that was a parabola. Okay? And then later, maybe in algebra 2, you saw x equals y squared was a sideways parabola. Okay. That's kind of what we have right now. We've got an x, we've got a y squared. That's a sideways parabola. Okay. But, you know, maybe we want to clean this up. Sometimes, sometimes we want it in a more standardized form. And so, take the part on the right, and we can square the two on the bottom. Maybe we'd rather look at it as x equals y minus 3 squared over 4. Or sometimes, you know, maybe we should multiply both sides by 4. We would have 4x equals y minus 3 squared, okay? Or, you know, if you really want to go all out, putting it in vertex form, it's pretty easy to see the vertex of this parabola is going to be the point zero three. We can see the vertex of this parabola right now is the point zero three. So here's your equation. Any one, any one of these will work. Let's let's leave it right here. Okay. Here's your equation. 
Um, but one thing that we really have to do is we have to account for this interval. When we look at the parabola, the sideways parabola, we notice that it doesn't continue on forever. Okay, it stops. It stops right here, and it stops because of that interval. If that interval had extended, then the, the graph would have extended further, but, um, but it stops. It stops, and if you look at the x-axis, it stops at 9. This graph goes from x equals 0 to x equals 9 and stops. So we want to pay attention to that. And really, we have to make a note of that in our answer and say for x in the interval from 0 to 9. If we don't say that, okay, if we don't add that extra little interval on there, then there's nothing that stops this sideways parabola from <coughs> continuing on indefinitely forever and ever and ever, okay? We have a parabola that stops at 9. We have a parabola that stops at 9, and so we need that extra saying to ensure that it stops where it needs to stop. Why does it stop at 9? Well, it stopped at 9 because our interval, our original interval from negative 3 to 3 made that happen. Example 3, we're graphing a plane curve, and so it's important to notice that you're graphing a set of xy points. Okay? x is given by 2 sine t, and y is given by 3 cosine t, and we're graphing it for t in the interval from 0 to 2 pi. So we're just going to think about this as a, a set of xy points. So let's go to Desmos and type it in. Okay, so we, we get part of it anyway, but we notice the interval is not set correctly. So let's change that from 0 to 2 pi. And what we see is a, an oval. We see an oval. I think it's interesting to play around with these numbers and see how they change things. Make them wider and taller and stuff. But, but here we've got our oval, and it looks like it goes from negative 2 to positive 2 from negative 3 down here to positive 3 down here. So this example wants me to sketch it. Let's make a quick sketch. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3. Not perfect, but we can definitely tell that that's an oval. Um, that's, that's a really easy thing to do with this graphing software. If I didn't have a graphing software, I'd have to change this to rectangular. Um, you know, and if you can remember what a rectangular equation looks like, um, it's going to end up looking like x over 2 squared plus y over 3 squared equals 1, or x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. You'd end up having to convert to rectangular if you were doing it by hand, we don't have to. Let's look at example four. Give two parametric representations for the equation. Okay. Now remember what parametric representations are. When they say that, they're talking about x equals some function of t and y equals some other function of t. Um, that's what they want. And so give two different representations. What they're asking us to do is just basically make something up. And so I'm going to keep it simple. I'm just going to let x equal t. That's about as simple as I can possibly make it. And let's see what happens to y in that case. If x was equal to t, then y would equal, just plug in t right there. Okay? Plug in t right there. You'd have t minus 2 squared plus 1. That's it. That's all we're asking for. Uh, parametric equation, x equal t, y equal t minus 2 squared plus 1. So they want two of them. Let's give another one. Um, let x equal, and, and I can really pick anything I want. 
Okay, you make it make it tough, make it easy, whatever. Just you have to choose different than, than T. So let's say we did T plus five. Okay, X equals T plus five. So what they're saying is X equals T plus five. We go right there. So then Y is going to equal. You got T plus five minus two right there. It's going to turn into T plus three. Y equals T plus 3 squared plus 1. Okay. That's two different parametric equations. Uh, you know, let's, let's just give a third one just because we didn't have to. But, but uh, imagine if I had let X equal, let's say that was T plus 2. T plus 2 is a good one to use. Let's say we pick T plus 2. Because if I, if I use T plus 2, I would have T plus 2 minus 2. And those twos are going to cancel out. So if I use x equal t plus 2, then y is going to equal t plus 2 minus 2 is just t. I'd have t squared plus 1. That'd be, a, that'd be a different way of representing this. That's a good way. So any of those three or anything else you could dream up really would be an acceptable answer for that. The cycloid is a special kind of parametric that has this form. Here's x. And here's y, okay? So still, we're still talking about parametric representation, all right? But here's what a cycle is. Imagine if you see somebody riding their bike in front of you, okay? Um, you know, across the horizon. And at some point, they, they ride over a, a wad of chewing gum, okay? That chewing gum is stuck to their tire. And as they roll around, you're watching them roll in front of you, roll by. Can you imagine the path that the chewing gum would take? Take your hand and, and try to, to demonstrate the path of the chewing gum. Okay? Most people that do this are, are, are forming a circle, like circle and circle and circle and circle. I think that's the logical thing, but that's not exactly how a cycloid works. Okay? Um, I've got a video that's, that's a decent um, visualization of this. So watch, watch the point on this tire. Okay? It's not quite making a circle. And this video is in Russian. Um, the sound, I've got the sound off because it's in Russian anyway. Um, but it's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good video, I think. Let me fast forward a little bit to where we're talking about the motorcycle. So here's going to be a motorcycle, kind of the same thing, right over like a, I don't know what that is, is that a rock? A rock. Um, I don't know why he has a chalkboard as a license plate. <laughs> so he rides over that rock and look at the path that that rock takes. Okay, it's not really going in a circle. It looks more like a bounce, kind of, or like a like a rabbit hop or something. So that's that's what we need to get out of the cycle. Okay, cycle is going to take kind of this this path. It looks like a, a bounce or a hop. So example five, we're going to graph this cycle. Okay, so no problem with Desmos. We're going to graph this cycloid. So look at this as an ordered pair. There's your x and there's your y in the interval from 0 to 2 pi. So let's graph that. Okay, so we can see there's one, one path of that cycloid, okay, which would coincide with one revolution of the bike tire or the motorcycle tire, okay. If you notice, it's hard to tell, but, um, you know, this, this comes down at about 6.28 or so, 6.28, that's 2 pi, all right, that's 2 pi. And so we can see, you know, when you look at the path of this, it starts at zero and it comes down. That's two pi. And of course, that's two pi. Two pi, like 360 degrees, that's one rotation of the tire, the bike tire. 
Um, so it goes up to uh, maximum height there of two, it looks like. I want you to change this two pi. Change the interval to four pi, six pi, eight pi, 10 pi. See what happens. I'm going to change it to 10 pi. Okay. 10 pi. Okay. Basically, 10 pi would represent five rotations of that tire, right? Five rotations of the tire. So the the chewing gum goes up and down to the ground and then all the way up to the top of the tire and then down to the ground. Five rotations. Okay. So do we have to draw, we have to graph it from zero to two pi. So that's what we have to graph, right? <clears throat> Let's draw it. Whoops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It might be good if you go by, uh, you know, intervals that would take you to two pi, um, but you don't necessarily have to go by pi over two or pi over four or anything like that. We're gonna go. Um, we're gonna go out to six point two eight, which is gonna be about right there. Okay, that's that's two pi. 6.28. We're going to start at zero. We're going to need to go up to two to a maximum height, and that's going to turn out to be about pi, 3.14 pi. So our maximum is going to be about right there. So draw your curve. Quick, quick sketch. That is the cycloid from zero to two pi. We can talk about applications of parametric equations where we're talking about hitting a golf ball or throwing a baseball or launching a rocket, or we can talk about how far it travels horizontally or how high it travels. And we can represent those, those distances with these parametric equations. Okay? Uh, we've got things such as velocity, V is representing the velocity, and over here H is representing the initial height. So like a golf ball hit off the ground would have an initial height of zero. But there's going to be an example where a, a girl hits a softball from two feet in the air, then H would equal two. Okay, and maybe uh, maybe you remember this number from physics class talking about uh, gravity. Um, but anyway, we've got this parametric representation of some kind of object in flight. Example 6 is talking about three golf balls hit simultaneously. We've got initial velocity of 132 feet per second. And we've got three different balls at three different angles, 30, 50, and 70. So part A says, assuming the ground is level, determine graphically which ball travels the farthest. Estimate this distance. I think the easiest thing for us to do is, is going to be the graph. Uh, graph. So, Looking back at our model, we can talk about the first one being um, 132 cosine 30 degrees times T, comma, 132 sine 30 degrees times T minus 16 T squared plus the initial height of zero because it hit off the ground. Okay? Now, when you enter this in on Desmos, I think you're going to need to put parentheses in right there. Otherwise, it's going to think the T is part of your, your cosine argument. And likewise, let's put parentheses here so that they don't think that the T is really inside of your sine argument. Otherwise, I suppose you could, could use a calculator and, and calculate 132 cosine 30 and 132 sine 30 and just change the decimal version. Maybe that's uh, easier for you, maybe that's more suitable. We'll see. So let's go to Desmos and let's graph this. Now since we are in degrees, you'll want to make sure and put put your uh, put your settings, change your settings, make sure that's in degrees right there. Otherwise it'll be all messed up. So let's see what we have.
Should I put that in parentheses there? Okay, 132 cosine 30 times t. And then over here we'll have Okay. Then you can put the plus zero on the end if you want. It's not going to change anything. But there's your parametric representation. Now, it looks like a line popped up, but that's not really a line. If you zoom out, <clears throat> that's not really a line. We just don't see enough of it. Change this to, I don't know, 2 pi. We can see an arc. That seems, that seems like what a golf ball might do. Okay. So um, let's try the others. Okay, let's, let's graph all three of them at the same time. So if you look at the other two parametric representations, the other two golf balls, the second one is going to be 132 cosine 50 times t and 132 sine 50 times t minus 16 t squared. And then the third one is going to be 132 cosine 70 times t, and 132 sine 70 times t minus 16 t squared. Again, I left out the zero because it's not going to do anything. Let's graph them. change the uh, it's not quite far enough it doesn't quite get to the axis so it doesn't really matter what you type in as long as it goes far enough to get past the axis I if I can just copy this change that to a 70 change that to a 70 okay that ought to do it and so, real quickly, you can see which one travels the farthest and which one travels the highest. And that's all we really need, I guess. We would have a graph that looks like this. Okay? So we'd have a graph that looks like this, but we haven't answered our question. Question A says, determine graphically which ball travels the farthest. Well, it's, it's definitely this one. And which one was that? Was that the third? That was the 50 degree angle. Here was the 30 degree and the 50 degree and the 70 degree angle. This one's the highest. This one's the farthest. So we just need to estimate what those distances are. Let's go in here and zoom. two. 536.23 it looks like, 536.22, okay, something like that, 536.22, let's just call it 536.2, assuming you're on this level, determine the graph, uh, which ball travels the farthest, that was ball two, right? Ball number two that was hit with 50 degrees, a 50 degree angle. And that traveled, what did we say? 536.2 about. Okay, so which one travels the highest? That's that's this one. Okay, so we should be able to. See how high that one is. Let's zoom in on that and see how high that is. To about 240, about 240. Okay, about 240 feet looks like. 
So which one was that? That was the third one. The third one was about 240 feet. This ball reaches the greatest height. And the three was the 70 degree one, which was about 240 feet high. Example seven, Jack launches a small rocket from a table that's 3.36 feet above the ground. Its initial velocity is 64 feet per second. And it's launched at an angle of 30 degrees. Okay, so real quick, we've got initial height, 3.36, and we've got initial velocity, 64 feet per second, and we've got an angle of 30 degrees. Okay, find the rectangular equation that models its path. So rectangular, when this says rectangular, we know that they're looking for x and y, right? So what they've given us is information that's good for a parametric representation. Um, what they want is this rectangular. So parametric, parametric, we've got an x and y, x function of t, y function of t. Let's look at the x part. That x part is going to be set up as the initial velocity times cosine of the angle times t. And then the y part is going to be the initial velocity times sine 30 times t minus 16t squared plus the initial height. So what I would recommend you do is, is uh, probably just type that 64 cos cosine 30 in on the calculator. Um, we're going to get some square roots. We're going to get some crazy looking decimals. So let's just uh, let's just change it to decimal to make our lives easier. Okay. So 64 cosine 30 is 55.425 basically. Um, I'm going to round off. I'm going to round off to about four decimal places. So what we want to do in this, in, in order to find a rectangular equation, is we want to solve one of the equations for t and then plug it into the other. Okay? Solve an equation for t and plug it into the other. So let's do that. We're going to take this one and solve for t. So I'm going to divide by that 55 number. We think about that as 1 over. So in order to isolate t here, I'm going to take 1 divided by my 55.4256 number. Okay, so I'm rounding up to four decimals, so I'm a little bit off, but that's okay. In this case, t would equal 0 0.0180 times x. Okay? So what I have to do is take that and plug that into the other equation. Plug that in for t. Okay? So, take this and put it in place of t right there and there. We're going to have 64 sine 30 times 0.0180. I'm going to go ahead and do 64 sine 30 while I'm thinking about 64 sine 30 is 32. So, that's going to say 32 times 0.0180x. Minus 16 times 0 0.0180x squared plus 3.36. Okay? Let's clean up just a little bit. I'm going to take 32 times 0 0.0180. And so right here I'd have 0.576x. And then I would have negative 16 times 0 0.0180 squared minus 0 0.0052 x squared and then plus 3.36. The only thing else I could do maybe is, is switch these two places just so it looks more like standard form. And I would have the equation y equals negative 0.0052x squared plus 0.576x plus 3.36. That's my rectangular equation. Okay? 
Now, you know, if I had it into this on the calculator, we'd have some, some square roots. There'd be a square root of three in there somehow. Uh, that might uh, be more precise. And, um, but I think that's just, this will be easier for us to work with. So I'm going to be fine with you rounding off to three or four decimals like this, okay? Um, as far as what path does this follow, this equation looks like a parabola to me, okay? So this path is going to be a parabolic path, okay? It's going to look like an upside down parabola. And that makes sense. That's what we would expect a rocket to fly like. Example 8, we want to determine the total flight time and horizontal distance traveled by the rocket in an example set. Okay, so go back and, and look at the one from example 7. What we need, we're going to need this equation right here. Okay, so I'm going to copy this and use this on the next page. Okay, we need this equation basically. So y equals that. And 64 sine 30, 64 sine 30 was 32. Sixty-four sine thirty was thirty-two. So if we call that thirty-two, I might even switch these two places just to clean it up a bit. We would have negative sixteen t squared plus thirty-two t plus three point three six. That looks a lot more like uh, the quadratic equation that we're used to dealing with. Okay, so if we want to solve this, we're going to set that y equal to zero, and we're going to try to solve this equation, find the zero. And so we can use the quadratic formula if you want. So plug all those coefficients in and do the quadratic formula, find your answer. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some technology. I've gone to uh, gone to the internet and found. Uh, website, I typed in quadratic equation solver, quadratic equation solver, like this. A lot of different sites will pop up, but basically what you have to do is type in your coefficients. There was a negative 16x squared plus 32x plus 3.36. And so you can see that this graphs it and it gives you the, the roots. The roots or the solutions are 2.1 and negative 0.1. 2.1 and negative 0.1 right here. So without showing my work, without showing my work here, I can see the t is either equal to 2.1 or negative 0.1. But we're talking about time here. We're talking about flight time. And so that second answer, that negative 0.1, isn't going to make sense. And so when we're talking about flight time, that flight time is going to be approximately 2.1 seconds. They also want to know the horizontal distance. So the horizontal distance, go back to the original equation, and the horizontal distance was given by this part, 64 cosine 30 times t. So the horizontal distance, 64 cosine 30 times t. 64 cosine 30 was 54.4. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have that number 55.4256, and we're going to multiply that by our time of 2.1 seconds. Get about 116.4. So that, that x number, that horizontal uh, position, the horizontal distance, is 116.4 feet. So distance traveled. About 400, uh, no, 116.4 feet.